Welcome and, and thank you for joining us. I'm Neil Boothby, professor and director of the Global Center for the Development of the Whole Child here at Notre Dame. And our center operates in 26 countries with the goal of creating pathways out of adversity for the world's most vulnerable children. I'm here with Dr. Kerry Quinn, a Notre Dame graduate, the class of 1996, a pediatrician and executive director of the Mount Sinai Parenting Center in New York City and co-chair of Notre Dame's For Good Initiative. Together, Kerry and I are launching a three-part series on raising resilient children. In this first episode, we'll focus on the first 1,000 days of life and why this is such a key time to invest in lifelong health and well-being. Our second event will discuss the synergies between science and faith and how, for example, Catholic social teaching paints a directive to prioritize the needs of children on the margins of society, while science in turn shows us how to do so. Father Lou Del Frey, a Holy Cross priest at Notre Dame, will join in this discussion. The third and final episode will bring the three of us together, so Carrie, Lou, and myself, to explore how Notre Dame is aligning this new science and the lived experiences and realities of families and children to create pathways out of adversity for the world's most vulnerable children. So I want to thank you for joining us. I hope you'll find it interesting, engaging. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Notre Dame's Alumni Association, the Institute for Educational Initiatives, and then the Global Center its, itself. So this first session will focus on the first thousand days of life and why this is such a critical time to invest in individuals, societies, and nation. And what does the science tell us about this critical period of time? And Carrie, I wonder if we could begin with you, if that's okay. Would you walk us through what has inspired your lifelong commitment to serving families and communities, both as a pediatrician, but also as executive director of your parenting center in New York City? Yes, thank you so much for having me here today. As you mentioned, I'm class of 96 from Notre Dame and a proud Notre Dame alumni. So I am thrilled to be able to share this topic with the audience because I find the science of how children develop to be fascinating. As far as what brought me into this field, I always knew I wanted to work with children. I, like many others, really believe that we can make the biggest impact through influencing the lives of children. They are really at the mercy of those around them to care for them, to educate them, and really to guide them to their fullest potential. And I entered the world of pediatrics because of that in my interest in science. But what led me to running a parenting center about early childhood development is really leaving my training as a pediatrician and entering the world of primary care and feeling like I didn't actually have the tools I needed to <sighs> support parents in many of the things they uh, wanted to know about, in particular, how to set their children up for success. So how to help their development. And that's their social emotional development, their cognitive development, and really how to parent in those early years. Uh, many parents felt alone in doing that. And we're really looking to the pediatrician for advice, and I didn't feel like I had the training for that. So as I embarked on understanding more about children's development, I was really blown away by the brain science that's out there. As we've talked about, the, the um, early brain development is massive. There's one million neural connections every second in a new child's brain. It's really, when you think about it, it's hard to really conceptualize it. And really then understanding that the environment that child's in is so critical to that, develop, that brain development in those early years. So the people around them, the environments around them, and the interactions they have in those early years. So understanding this made me really understand the gap that there was out there in the training of pediatricians. So in 2014, I joined forces with a few colleagues to create the Mount Sinai Parenting Center which is really a designed to fill the gap in the training and knowledge in the healthcare system about how children develop, how important that development is for future outcomes, and what 
specific parenting behaviors can influence that development. And we saw an incredible opportunity in the healthcare space because we are in front of parents from the moment they become parents mm -hmm. and at countless times between then and before they enter school. That's really what led me to this path of really spreading the science of how children develop. That's fabulous. Thank you. And your center has such great materials and does such terrific work. It's really a resource for your, your residents in medical school, but I also, it's just full of great ideas for parents and others. So thanks for that terrific work. And I'm just curious, again, moving from practice to more prevention and more of a public health approach to, to early childhood development is, is just, uh, is fabulous. I guess to some extent, my own engagement with these issues is also kind of experientially uh, born, so to speak. I was a graduate student at Harvard and I was working at a mental health clinic in East Somerville, uh, which is a working class sliding towards welfare community. And I, I won't go into the long story, but I met a 13 year old girl from Vietnam who had come over here as a boat person back in the days where the Saigon fell and her mother had been killed at sea and she was living with some other Vietnamese individuals that were not relatives, but she had gone through such tragedy. And yet within a year and a half at the school level, she was the best math student. She had mastered English. She was doing extremely well, still very, very much hurt by the tragedies went through, but functioning in an incredibly high level. It just launched my interest in, in resilience and how is it kids can go through tragic things and still function at a very high level. And I guess my focus on early childhood development, again, was born out of a sort of a tragic moment where I was working with the UN right after the genocide in Rwanda, working in what was then Zaire, <clears throat> where almost a million people had come in as refugees, starving, read thin, weak, and they went to Lake Kivu, drank the water, and there was a huge outbreak of cholera. And at the worst period of time, there was about 10,000 people dying per month. And so relief workers would go out and see people who had died and there would be children laying next to them and they would pick them up. The babies went to a Caritas orphanage. And when I entered there, there was maybe 22 babies laid out on cots and they all had IVs in their arms. So the micronutrient issue was being dealt with, but nobody was picking them up. And when I picked up one of the boys <clears throat> who was, excuse me, about six months old, I think he was physically alive, but had moved on. He wasn't going to make it. And I guess it's called failure to thrive, but it just reinforced the criticality of human relationships. And we don't come into the world outside of relationship. We don't survive outside of relationships and we clearly don't thrive out of relationships. And I remember at that moment recalling the birth of my own child, Peter, who came into the world with this just look of bewilderment or wonder on his face when he entered the world. And later, about three or four months old, when you look in their face and then they respond to you and they laugh and they engage and there's that connectedness, that child that I picked up who died very shortly thereafter, that absence of human connectedness contrasted with my own experience with my own son <clears throat> has just haunted me and I hopefully in a good way. And it just, to me, again, it showed the criticalness of, yeah. excuse me, why investing in this, in this period oh, is so important. I wonder if you could talk a bit about how adverse events affect brain health and endanger human development. What is toxic stress? How does the accumulation of toxic stress undermine positive human development? Yeah. Hearing your story about relationships and the connectivity and how essential that is as a basic need, a basic human need, is really the context in which I think of adversity. Like we all have need and sometimes we think about them as structural food, shelter, safety, nutrition. But there's also that component of relationships and the security that you are being cared for by someone. And with toxic stress, which you hear a lot about, is really when your basic needs aren't being met, your body releases stress hormones. So you have a flood of adrenaline and cortisol that are released by your body. 
in order for you to survive. It's an right. adaptive mechanism for survival. But when you are bathed in those hormones chronically, it is damaging. Yeah. It's da you know, been shown to be damaging to neurons and, and even can alter your um, genetics at the level of the DNA. You can really alter gene expression that puts somebody at risk for long-term long -term complications. We can see increased risk of heart disease, of autoimmune disorders, of mental health disorders at the genetic level because you really turn on or turn off genes um, under these extreme stressful chronic situations. So we know that it is imperative that we address toxicity in an early age to help prevent that toxicity. But we also know that it's really so difficult to learn if you are bathed in this cortisol. So if you think back to that brain we were talking about with the one million neural connections every second, imagine it in a bath of stress hormones and it just wants children to absorb new material and to be able to learn. So not only is it damaging, but it prevents their growth and their development. So when we think about that adversity in those early years, this is a critical time for children developing. We need to intervene and see what are the things we can do to reduce that toxic stress. Thanks, Carrie. That's I always learn something important when we when we spend time together like this. I think the research does say the accumulation of risk research suggests that most kids could get through like one one bad experience or even two bad experiences. But when you start bundling these adversities together and the toxic stress floods the body, what we see is four to five fold increase in the likelihood of having negative adult outcome, pretty serious outcome as, as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess in India, we see this in our work there. We're working with uh, the tribal society and the social welfare society in the state of Telangana who have created 451 schools for children who come out of the scheduled caste or this untouchable caste, which unfortunately that level of discrimination is still very much alive, even though it's been outlawed for decades. And what we see, the children don't come into these residential schools until the fifth grade. And we see them entering, having had some pretty horrendous experiences already. So I've visited schools, regular schools where these children go to before they come to the, to the society school. And girls, for example, in order to be in school, if you're from the unscheduled caste, you have to clean toilets. They don't just let you come as a student. You have to be a, a toilet cleaner, someone who cleans up the premises. And if you're a boy, you're told to sit in the back of the classroom and you can't eat with other kids. So by the time they come into the society schools in fifth grade, they're often malnourished, some, sometimes stunted, but there's been significant uh, damage, I would say, done to their self-esteem, their self-agency, the sense of who they are and what they can achieve. They've been told that you can't achieve. You got to sit in the back of the classroom because you're, you're too dumb to learn. So a lot of the work we do in these schools is trying to create a culture in which we're uh, focusing not just on catching them up academically, but also rebuilding senses of agency, cooperation, self-esteem, and whatnot. And those kinds of qualities that are very important for not only academic success, but life success. I wish we could intervene earlier. We're actually looking to for support to start a pilot program where we would start school readiness programs in these communities uh, for, where kids are going to come into the society schools and then kind of compare uh, a number of criteria uh, against kids that aren't getting this early advantages. And we think that data will help us shift the policies, at least in the state of Telangana. So Carrie, um, why is this period, you've already danced around and given us some good information, but from the last tri-semester of pregnancy to the second or so year of life, why is this so important in, in shaping human development? What do we know about specific practices uh, that promote positive child development? Um, right, that, that's a great question because there's, it's such a vast field. And so what I was quite amazed by is how scientists in, in the field of early childhood have really broken down the science into studying very specific domains of development. 
So they're studying language development, social, emotional development, cognitive development, physical development, like really all the domains. And they look at very specific aspects of that and can study how and when are children developing these skills? How are they linked to long-term outcomes? There are many longitude of very long studies that have tracked children over time to really see the skill building in the early years. How does that predict future outcome? And then there's a lot of research specifically on what is teachable, because some things might be more innate. You're born with a certain temperament and other things, but then there are very teachable skills. So what, what is teachable and what behaviors, so specifically parenting behaviors, can influence that development? It's really not a, a you know, a, a goal. Uh, we can look at one area, for example, language development. We know babies recognize the sound of their mother's voice from the moment they're born. So we know they were recognizing that voice even earlier and they were learning at that point. Yeah. We know from science that the number of words the child hears and the quality with which those words are spoken, and especially in back and forth interactions as a child gets older, really influences their development of language, their vocabulary, and their future reading and literacy skills. So to understand that even at that early years before a child can talk, they're learning language, and knowing what types of parenting behaviors can influence that, we have a lot of knowledge we can spread to parents that might not know that they shouldn't be talking to their child or that is going to actually make them more successful later in in reading and other things. It's really about taking that knowledge and getting it out there to people and knowing here are the things that have been shown to, to help children develop language. Here are things we can all do as a community to help in that early period with children. Another domain, for example, would be um, self-regulation. So this is really about a child learning to manage their emotions, learning to manage their behaviors or their impulses, learning to manage their attention to be able to get done the things they want to do. So as they get older, they'll have different goals in place. And can they manage these things to accomplish their goals? We know that self-regulation and self-control has been tied to so many outcomes, whether it's success in school, success in relationships, um, physical health, so habits, impulse control, and in different healthy lifestyles and habits are really tightly correlated. We can see it with aggressive behavior, that ability to control your impulse to lash out or get in a fight. Those are linked to future um, aggression and even criminal activity we can see later. So we know that this is a skill where it's developing at the earliest ages and that building it at the early years can really impact life trajectories for children and for adults. We, in, in the work we do, we take that knowledge and then we say, okay, what things can parents do at the early ages to help promote self-regulation? And there's a world of science on that. And at the earliest ages, it's really about helping that child regulate so helping them when they have strong emotions and they're crying, helping to soothe them, helping to manage their those difficult emotions when they can't do it themselves. A lot of that's called co-regulation, where they use the adult around them to regulate themselves. And then you know, as they get older, it's labeling emotions, talking about emotions, working through that. That's an important part of being able to manage your emotions is first understanding them. And then there are different activities as a child gets older that we know from just our own childhoods of games like Simon Says or Red Light, Green Light. What those games are, they seem like simple childhood games, but you're actually teaching children to pause and think before you react. When Simon Says, you change the activity and that's a, it's a great game for teaching that impulse control of what you think you want to do, but you have to stop and think about the instruction that was given first. So that's an example of development of self-regulation. There are many other domains, but I would say one domain to highlight is the importance of what we talked, what you just talked about, Neil, about relationships. Having a secure attachment or a relationship with an adult where a child feels seen and heard and understood, cared for and nurtured 
it's so critical for all of the develop all development. So if there's any one thing that we try to focus our work on is really how can we help parents in that role they play of being that nurturer for their children and knowing that responding to a child in that warm and nurturing way is actually very important for them to develop that security they need. And that's an important element of reducing that toxic stress. Because the, the studies are quite remarkable yes. right now. But amongst a lot of adversity, if you have that one adult who you feel is caring for you and you feel safe with and you feel secure with, it, that can buffer against that adversity mm. be affecting you. Because if you think about it, you, a child, it's really the relationship with that caregiver. They can feel nurtured, they can feel cared for, they feel safe, that's going to reduce all those stress hormones, no matter what the outside environment is. The key is to, to be able to support the parent in doing that, because sometimes there's outside factors that are so stressful that it, they might not have the capacity to provide that for their child. We talk a lot about how can we pass along those messages to those who care for adults and children mm. in, in those parenting behaviors that have been shown to give that child that security at an early age. Again, it's predictive of so many outcomes, relationships, school, work. Mental health is so correlated to how did that child feel, the worthiness of that child? Did they feel that self-worth? You mentioned that earlier about that importance of them developing that, knowing that they're worthy by having an adult show them they are worthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, thank you for that, those insights. A again, I think that kind of these recent breakthroughs in neuroscience and neuroimaging, we can actually go in and see how brains develop. You know, we can create simulations that, that can be used as learning materials and whatnot. And Carrie, earlier you talked about the way that the epigenetic signature sort of genes get turned on and off by external influences. And one of the and that can have, if it's stressful, that can have adverse effects. On the other hand, the positive effects, when you pick up your baby and hold her, when she's cold or tired or you feed her when she's hungry, that social interaction is also becoming part of children's biology, right? In real time. It's not just about genetics and next generational stuff, but we influence, we've actually become part of our children's biology through the way that we engage with them in some ways. And so it's, it really, to some extent, it's the biological origins of risk and resilience, mm -hmm. depending on those influences. And in our work, in some of the more impoverished parts of the world, what we find is the science to me is so stunt and so directive of what needs to happen. And it's relatively simple is not the right word, but when you're talking about what short of changing someone's socioeconomic status or economic status. What can be done if you're a parent raising a child in, a, in, in an impoverished, sort of economically impoverished thing? It's, it's your love. It's the social interaction and it's nutrition. And when you put those two things together, your child has the best sense of getting off to a strong beginning, which is, the, again, launching a pathway out of adversity. And we see, Carrie, when we work with parents and they become familiar or they begin to understand basic things like, ah, love, feeding, nutritious food, um, playing, reading. Hey, these are things that we can do. This doesn't cost a lot of, a, a lot of money. And when they understand that their love and social interaction becomes part of their child's biology, that is a transformative, transformative moment we've seen when parents realize that it opens up all kinds of possibilities. So again, I think the challenge is how do you operationalize the science in different right. contexts? To add to that, it's so empowering when someone might feel like they don't have power or they don't have money or resources exactly. to know you have something that you alone can give your child that is more powerful than even as they come into the pediatrician, I say more powerful than the things I can give you. You have, you already have those things and those tools. And like you said, it's your interaction with your child. And so I think when they, one might feel overwhelmed or hopeless, knowing that they have something that can buffer their child from that stress and, and toxicity, I think is really um, a gift to share with parents that they have that. 
Yeah, no, it's, it can be very transformative, shifting mindsets and even changing, changing behavior. Carrie, I know that you do a lot of really cool stuff. You have video and tips and whatnot that come out of Mount Sinai Parenting Center, which I would encourage everyone to take a look at. We also have come up with uh, videos that we use in our sort of parent empowerment exercises, one of which, if you're interested, it focuses really on school readiness that we produce for Haitian families. It's in Creole, but you'll understand it through the images. And you can, if you're interested, you can visit thinknd.edu to see it in this additional resource section. But fundamentally, what we try to do is because parents will say, ah, I'm too busy. I work hard, which is often true. Haitian mothers, for example, are really, really hard workers. So our approach really is, okay, you're busy, but there's things you can do in your everyday life. If you're walking down the street and I don't know, a sign on a, on a building, you can point out what the letters are, ask your children to repeat that. If you're washing dishes, you can talk about shapes. You can talk about colors. If you're at the market trying to sell goods, you can engage your kids in counting money and various things. So there's ways in which you can work on this pre-literacy, pre-numeracy stuff of, of what you're doing. And I think when parents realize that it can be as basic as that, uh, it, it becomes to, uh, quite. Right. And I like that you're not asking them to do more. You're saying do things differently with the moments you already have. So that's a lot of what we try to integrate. The, the families that might need this information the most or want to do it or or striving to do it, they might not have that much extra time. They can't go to an extra yeah. class yeah. or do extra activities. They need to use their moments differently. Yeah, and that's well that's put. Great. That's very well put. Thank you for that. So Carrie, back to your parenting center for a few moments, please. What does success look like? What are the milestones you seek to reach? And could you maybe share a couple of success stories? Yes, so that's a, a, a great question. So at the highest level, success to us is that everybody knows the science. I, this, there's, again, a vast amount of silence, science about how children develop and what we can all do as parents and caregivers to help children thrive. I just want everybody to know that science and to understand what they can do with that science to operationalize it. It's not just, hey, read this great article or look at all this science. It's we're going to translate the science into very actionable activities, messages, behaviors that parents that are they're concrete examples of, oh, okay, I can do this one thing differently and I will be doing a, a service to my child's development. And we break it down into hundreds and hundreds of small moments in Again, our primary audience is the healthcare system and healthcare providers. So we do simple things like while you're examining a child, it's a great time to talk out loud what you're doing moment by moment, because it's one of the ways you can fill, you can model for parents how to fill a child's day with words. Just talk out loud about what you're doing. We call it sports casting, like a sports caster on TV. And but it's really an example like that is just getting it out there. It's getting the science out there, but it's also showing a concrete example of how to put it into action. So success for us is, again, the science out there. So with us, that means training every healthcare provider who engages with children zero to five. Or we did the work and figured out how many providers across the country, about 150,000, are providing primary care visits from birth to age five. We want them all to know about this and we want them all to know exactly what they could say and do in a visit. Because like we said earlier, the science is there. We don't want it to sit on a shelf. We really want it to be into practice. And like you mentioned earlier, there are many other things that we know need to be in place to help children thrive. We need education systems. We need good health care, food, nutrition, safety. But like you said, this is one tangible thing that we can all do. And so I don't want it to be the case where this wasn't what a child, the environment a child grew up in because nobody knew about it. I can understand lots of other reasons why this it might not happen that we can advance how engaging a child's early environment it is, is, but it shouldn't be because the knowledge wasn't there and the people surrounding that family didn't know ways they could support the family in doing that. Yeah, that's so well. So well put. I just, I think it's brilliant what you're doing because pediatricians, obviously for many people in the United States is the go-to person when you're, when your child, when you're pregnant and your child's born and they're, they're after and to equip 
pediatricians to be able to look beyond the physical health into these key developmental milestones and the basic things parents can do to pr promote brain health and success in life is just, it's fabulous. It's, it is the mechanism in the U.S. that needs to be activated and then on, on to parent and then eventually having impacts on kids. Where we work, um, in many cases, women don't have access to neonatal care and the Physicians may be a few and far in between. Uh, so the health clinic is one of the places that, that you go. But we also work, for example, with in Haiti and Kenya, for example, with the Catholic parish system. We're in 320 school communities in Haiti, for example, 200 are Catholic parish communities where you have a church, you have a school that belongs to the church, and then you have families that go to each. And so in a country like Haiti, where there really isn't a robust child welfare, health uh, system, education system. I think the government only provides about 15% of the education in Haiti. That Perry system, the unit of change. And so we're working to, with households to get parents to understand what their roles are. The schools where we're with preschool introducing play-based learning. It's really interesting. If you look at babies when they first come into the world and they're just laying on their back or their stomachs, they're constantly moving and exploring and discovering. Parents have to kind of shape that interaction to make it safe. But children are, are the drivers of their exploration. And then they go to school and we stop letting them explore. Uh, and especially in Haiti, for example, in, in the preschools, there was just a lot of dead time where they're just sitting there behind their desk, maybe reading or reciting something the teacher said, ABC or the equivalent thereof. So we're shifting pedagogy and, and the importance of letting children discover through play uh, what's there. So for me, I guess success is about parents. So I think it's similar to what you were saying, Kara. Parents are, have privy to the science and they're able to understand the critical role that they play, that they are the champions in their children's lives. And regardless of income, you can still make a huge difference. I, th I think that's a good point too. The that the some don't know that information, so you're sharing the science, but others need to be reminded. So when kids enter school, yeah. that there is still an element of that child-led discovery oh, yeah. and how much they can learn when they're not just spoken to and instructed about things or told that they just need to achieve certain milestones, but that it, it is them exploring. Interesting things that the, the learning is so much more robust when there's a balance of that. So it's almost reminding others as well, com the whole community of the importance of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you for that. Perhaps one, one last sort of round of discussion here, and maybe we'll shift to talk a little bit about the role of the university. What is the role of the university in addressing the challenges of the first thousand days of life of, of operationally is that operationalizing that science as much as possible and as far as possible. And I guess from my standpoint, Carrie, I would, I, I think the science basically tells us that if we really do want to change the world to shape it and make it truly better, we need to start early. As you pointed out, even in, in, in during the embryonic development and, and kids can hear parents talking to them, music and there other sorts of influences. So it clearly starts at birth, if not even before birth. And what we see in a tangible way is that, for example, 60 to 70% of the achievement gap between children, say, growing up in welfare families or poor families versus professional families, 60, 70% of the achievement gaps between those two sets of kids is evident before you even start formal school. And, and sometimes that's referred to as the 30 million word gap that kids in professional families, by the time they start school, will have heard and to some extent understand 30 million more words than kids in poor families. So again, the question of the criticality of the household and parents as the first teachers and pre-literacy exposure to words may be a better matrix of alleviating poverty than some of the other things that, that one could do. We work in 26 different countries and our goal really is to spread this word. We often work through the Catholic church and parish systems. I think we do have a role to play as a universe, creating pathways out of adversity for children on the margins, engaging with the global Catholic church and preparing youth for life success, but also 
we have a course called Global Childhoods, that's the acronym, but we engage our own students in these different projects. So they have the opportunity to help shape the world for better as well. But I'm wondering maybe uh, Carrie, of a closing on that as an alumnus and a pediatrician and ECD expert, and now the co-chair with your husband of the Notre Dame for Good Initiative, how is investing early in uh, er, investing in early childhood development aligned with our university's emerging strategic plan, or is it aligned? Yeah, I, do, I think it couldn't be more beautifully aligned as the For Good Initiative's mission. It's really to, it's our calling to serve a world deeply in need. And it's really about how can Notre Dame as an institution serve those in need. And our provost, John McGreevy, has um, unveiled the strategic framework. And it's beautiful if you haven't had a chance to read it yet in really highlighting what Notre Dame can, what areas Notre Dame can work on to really do that mission of serving a world deeply in need and where are our strengths and where can we focus in the coming years. And there are several different pillars. We have democracy and ethics and poverty, mental health. There's many areas. We know the world needs problem solvers, needs solutions, needs people talking and coming together to really address these issues. And we need students who are focused on as they're learning their strengths and their gifts and how they can use their education to, to serve others, how can they see what Notre Dame's doing work and be a part of it to do that? So I really believe when we think about early childhood and you think about the link to long-term outcomes, you can find a direct correlation to almost any of those needs of the world. So if we think democracy or if we think about mental health or we think about poverty, like you just said, there you can draw lines often back to the early years. And mm -hmm. even if it's something t teaching children about perspective taking and empathy and how to understand another perspective, that's a critical skill children are learning at an, at an early age. And it only goes to build at later years of being able to resolve conflicts and being able to talk to each other and to be able to work towards solutions together. If you build those skills early, you have much more a better chance of them leading to those positive um, outcomes later. I think you can think of most problems and you can, again, you mentioned poverty and you can look back and if those early years are foundational in building that platform children need to be successful in school and to be successful in the workforce, the investment early pays off huge dividends later. It's why I focus on early childhood development because I can see the biggest impact for our world, mm -hmm. like for peace, for harmony, for relationships, for just thriving, human thriving. I really feel like we can build strong beginnings to get to those goals. And I think it aligns beautifully with the framework that has been created by John McGreevy and the university. And we're doing so much of that work at Notre Dame already. It's how do you tie it all together? And how do you think about that mission of serving the world? So I'm really honored to be a part of this on every dimension as a chair, co-chair of the, the initiative, the For Good initiative, as an alumni, as just a professional in the work I do. I'm really lucky to be a part of it and to see all the work that's being done. Yeah. Thank you. I think you're a gift to the world. I remember when you engaged with the center's team, I think there were about 41 of us online uh, on a Zoom call in different parts of the world where they're based and also our global team. And we had several of our students were on that call as well. And I've talked to the students afterwards and they were just thrilled. In fact, I think they've already reached, some of them have already reached out. Isabella Hernandez is a great young woman. She's a neuroscience major. I think she's contacted you. I mean, you're a great role model for, for all of us. And I really want to thank you for your generosity of spirit and your time and talent and expertise. You're just phenomenal. I also want to thank all of you that joined us today. And I want to thank uh, Think ND for hosting this event. There's two more uh, sessions on uh, raising resilient children, where we'll discuss the connections between early childhood development and Catholic social teaching. And then in the third one, that'll bring Carrie and Lou and I back together how the university is bringing these two worlds of thought together to build pathways out of adversity for kids on the margin. So thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you. 
always thank a you. pleasure and thank all of you. And we'll see you next time. Yeah. See you soon. Thank you.